Hello all, this is your audio version of chapter 23, Patterns of Gene Inheritance. So genetics explains the process of inheritance and why there are variations between offspring from one generation to the next. Understanding inheritance patterns is especially important in agriculture, animal husbandry, and medicine. So our understanding of genetics is based on the work of Gregor Mendel, and he investigated inheritance in plants in the 1860s and concluded that plants transmit distinct factors to offsprings, now called genes found on chromosomes. In plants and humans, chromosomes come in pairs called homologous chromosomes. One member of the pair is inherited from the mother and the other from the father. And they have certain characteristics. They have the same length and centromere location. Both carry similar types of genes. And they have alternate forms of a gene called alleles. Alleles for a particular gene are found at a locus on the chromosome. So here's an example of homologous chromosomes as they go through replication and they produce sister chromatids. The law of segregation. Mendel had no knowledge of chromosomes, but he decided based on his observations that the following were true. Each pea plant has two factors for each trait, and one factor can be dominant over the other, and they separate during the formation of gametes or sex cells. And each gamete or sex cell, such as sperm or egg, contains only one factor from each pair of factors. And the fertilization of sperm and egg gives each new individual two factors for each trait. So very important, the phenotype is an individual's actual appearance. It may include physical characteristics or microscopic or metabolic characteristics. The genotype are the alleles carried by the chromosomes that are responsible for a given trait. In diploid organisms such as humans, a pair of homologous chromosomes contain two alleles for each trait. One allele is on each member of the homologous pair, and men will use letters to indicate each allele. A capital letter symbolizes a dominant allele, and a lowercase letter symbolizes a recessive allele. And dominant refers to the allele that will mask the expression of the alternate or recessive allele when both are present in a given organism. So the example here given is freckles. The dominant allele of freckles is assigned to a capital F. The recessive allele of no freckles is assigned a lowercase f. In the case of a single trait, there are three possible combinations of the two alleles. If the two alleles are the same, the individual is said to be homozygous. If the two alleles are different, the individual is said to be heterozygous. So an organism with the capital F or the dominant allele exhibits no matter what the other allele is. So both capital F, capital F, and capital F, lowercase f, have the freckles phenotype. And here's just a table showing how the phenotype affects, or the genotype affects phenotype. And the only way you get no freckles is for a homozygous recessive genotype. So the genotype has two alleles for each trait when the gamete has one allele for a trait. So during meiosis, homologous chromosomes separate, so one member of each pair is in each haploid cell, which form gametes. Therefore, only one allele exists for each trait in a haploid gamete. No two letters in a gamete can be the same letter of the alphabet. Here are the steps used to solve a genetics cross. Determine the genotype of each parent, list the possible gametes from each parent, combine all possible gametes, and determine the genotypes and phenotypes of all offspring. So here's a sample cross. A homozygous man with freckles reproduces with a woman without freckles. Each parent has only one type of gamete, so all offspring have the same genotype and phenotype. So 
So here's a monohybrid cross between two heterozygotes. So three-fourths the offspring will have freckles, uh, one-fourth will not have freckles. And this is known as a Punnett square. So after determining the genotype and phenotypes, you can get a genotypic ratio, which is shown here, and a phenotypic ratio. So the three to one phenotypic ratio is expected for any monohybrid cross when one allele is completely dominant over the other. The ratio only represents probability, a 75% chance of a child having a dominant trait each time offspring is produced. And a chance of two or more independent events occurring together is a product of their chance of occurring separately. It's a product rule probability. So if the cross is big F, little F times big F, little F, what's the chance of obtaining an F or an F from a parent? It's one half. So you can see they're probably having these genotypes as follows. There's a one in four chance of having a homozygous dominant, one in four chance of having a het, and a one in four chance of having a homozygous recessive for freckles. And so the sum rule probability states that the chance of an event that can occur in more than one way is the sum of the individual chances. So here the chance of having freckles is 75% or no freckles 25%. So one cannot determine by observation if an individual expressing a dominant trait is homozygous or heterozygous, so a test cross must be performed. If there are any offspring produced with a recessive phenotype, then a dominant parent must be heterozygous. So here is a homozygous dominant or a heterozygous for a single trait. So we have a man with freckles mating with a woman who lacks freckles. And so we can determine here the man is homozygous dominant because there are no offspring that have no freckles. Here are the results when a heterozygous male, four freckles, mates with of a homozygous recessive female, and offspring it's 50-50 chance whether they have freckles or no freckles. So during meiosis, each gamete receives one member of each pair of homologous chromosomes, one from the mother and one from the father, and they separate independently. It does not matter which member of a pair goes into which gamete. A gamete will receive one hom homologue of each homologous pair, and thus one allele of each gene. So here is a diagram showing how homologous pairs of chromosomes separate during meiosis. So Mendel had no knowledge of what meiosis, but re realized his results were attainable only if sperm and eggs contained every possible combination of factors. And this gave rise to the law of independent assortment. Each pair of factors assorts independently, and all possible combinations of factor can occur in the gametes. You can also perform two trait crosses, or called dihybrid crosses. And it illustrates the law of independent assortment. So here's a sample cross. A person homozygous for freckles and short fingers, big F, big F, big S, big S, and we have a person who has no freckles and long fingers, or little F, little F, and little S, little S, and that is a cross. So according to the law of segregation, the gametes for the big F, big F, big S, big S parent must be big F, big S, and the gametes for the little should be little f, little s. All of the offspring with the same phenotype, freckles and short fingers, because the dominant of alleles of control the phenotype. However, in the next generation, if the hybrid is a heterozygous of reproducing, the law of segregation states that each gamete gets one letter of each kind, and the law of independent assortment states that all combinations are possible. So we, in a typical dihybrid cross, you will have the ratio, the phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. 
So nine of the individuals have freckles with short fingers, three of the individuals have freckles with long fingers, three of the individuals no freckles with short fingers, and one of the individuals no freckles and long fingers. So there is a punny square showing this dihybrid cross. And here are the gametes in the formation of the F1 generation. Dihybrid cross demonstrated once again. And this lets out all the probability of the crosses. And once again, uh, it shows the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. So once again, by inspection of an individual expressing a dominant allele, you cannot tell if they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. So a test cross has to be done once again with someone with a recessive phenotype because we know the genotype there. So if a woman who is homozygous dominant for freckles and short fingers reproduces with a man who is homozygous recessive for breast traits, then all of her children will have dominant phenotypes. If a woman is heterozygous for breast traits and each child has a 25% chance of showing one or both recessive allele, allele. So the four phenotypes will be at a ratio of one to one to one to one. Here's the punny square of that cross. So there are observable traits in humans that follow Mendelian patterns, and there are diseases that do the same thing. And these traits are controlled by a single gene located on an autosomal chromosome or any chromosome other than the sex chromosomes X and Y in humans. A pedigree is just a chart of the family's history with regard to a particular genetic per trait, and this can be done for humans, well as dogs, fish, livestock. Males are defined by squares and females are defined by circles. And individuals affected by the trait or disease are often shaded or black. And this is used to determine whether inherited condition is due to autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive alleles. So here is a pedigree for autosomal dominant. Remember the affected are shaded in, in yellow. In this pattern, the child is affected, but neither parent is. This can only happen if the disorder is recessive and the parents are heterozygotes. Once again, here is an autosomal recessive pedigree. And you can tell that by most children who are affected have parents who are not affected. The heterozygotes have an unaffected phenotype. And two parents who are affected will always have children that are affected and close relatives of Rutus are more likely to have children who are affected. So an example of an autosomal recessive disorder in humans is Tay-Sachs disease, very common among the Jewish population, and it results in a lack of an enzyme called hexaminidase, or hexa. Of the substrate, glycosphenigoid lipid is stored in lysosomes, and these lysosomes build up in brain cells, resulting in deterioration of motor functions. So here's an example of the neurons that are affected by Tay-Sachs. Another autosomal recessive disorder is cystic fibrosis. It's the most common lethal genetic disorder among Caucasians in the United States. And it's a chloride ion channel that fails and causes abnormally thick mucus in the bronchial tubes and causes this individual to cough a lot. So here is a, the example cystic fibrosis disease where the pump does not work properly and the respiratory tract fills with thick sticky mu mucus. Another autosomal recessive disorder is phenylketonuria or PKU and they lack an enzyme needed for the metabolism of phenylalanine and infants will develop normally if placed on a low phenylalanine diet, but severe intellectual disabilities will otherwise result. Another autosomal recessive disorder is sickle cell disease. These are red blood-shaped cells that are irregular and sickle-shaped due to abnormal hemoglobin. It's so one immune acid change. 
and you get clogging of blood vessels and breakdown of red blood cells. And other symptoms include poor circulation, anemia, and low infection resistance. So there's just a picture of normal red blood cells and a sickle red blood cell. This happens in sickle cell disease. So autosomal dominant disorders. This pattern, the child is unaffected, but both parents are affected. This is possible if the condition is autosomal dominant and both the parents are heterozygotes. Here's a pedigree of an autosomal dominant disease. All right, children who are affected usually have a parent who is affected. Heterozygotes are also affected and two parents who are affected can produce a child who is not affected. Both males and females are affected equally and you usually see affected individuals in every generation. So Marfan syndrome is an autosomal dominant disease. It's caused by a defect in a, in a protein called fibrillin. And this is present in the eyes of the bones, the fingers, the ribs, and the aorta. And if the aorta is weak, there's a, a, a risk of rupturing. Another autosomal dominant disorder is Huntington's disease. And this leads to progressive degeneration of brain cells. It's caused by a mutated copy of the gene called Huntington. And most patients appear normal to their middle age and already have children. There's no effective treatment, but there's a test now to tell you if, if you have the disease or not. And there's just an example of loss of neurons in the Huntington brain on the right compared to the many neurons in the normal brain on the left. Another Autosomal dominant disorder is osteogenesis imperfecta, and this usually uh, results from collagen mutations and causes weakened brittle bones, and they have skin elasticity and weakened teeth. Uh, it is treatable with drugs that are taken for long-term of bone mass increase. So these are simple inheritance patterns, all right, that, that basically follow Mendelian genetics. But there are a lot of other diseases that do not follow these simple patterns. So incomplete dominance occurs when the heterozygote has intermediate phenotype. So an example is of breeding in the four o'clock plant strain, where, where a true, excuse me, a red flower is made it with a, a white flowered strain. And the offspring have pink flowers. And then when you breed two pink flowers together, they have a phenotypic ratio of one to two to one. One red flower, two pink flowered, and one white flower. Here's a punny square of, of that of breeding. And so an example of incompletely dominant genetic disorder is, is familial of hypocholesterolemia, which causes increased cholesterol of in the person and a lot of traits are controlled by multiple alleles such as the abo blood groups in humans <coughs> excuse me so there you can have a antigens on your blood cells b antigens on your blood cells or neither and that would be blood type o and both A and B are dominant over O, but A and B are co-dominant and can produce it, the type AB blood. And here's just a punny square of breeding of different blood types and what the results are. So co-dominance occurs when alleles are equally expressed in a heterozygote. So the example here is blood type AB. They both have both proteins on their surface. Of RH factor is inherited separately from the ABO blood types. And the RH positive person has the RH anion or protein on, her, on his or her red blood cells. And there are multiple recessive alleles for the H minus negative phenotype. And there's also polygenic inheritance, which occurs when a trait is governed or controlled by two or more sets of genes. All right. And this results in continuous variation of phenotypes. Uh, a good example of this is skin color. Uh, there's lots of different skin colors in people. 
So over 100 different genes influence skin color. And so you get variation from people and their offspring. All right, here we go once again, showing that there's, you can have variation in skin color and polygenic inheritance. It's shown best in the next graph though. So you have very light skinned to very dark skinned people, depending on the number of dominant alleles. You know, environmental factors such as nutrition and temperature can ex affect the expression of genetic traits. So examples are height is influenced by nutrition. Uh, there are certain flower colors that are influenced by temperature. And so polygenic traits that have environmental influences, such as height in humans, are often displayed in a bell-shaped curve. So some, some people are short, most people are medium in height, and some people are super tall. So there's also uh, Siamese cats and Himalayan rabbits are darker in color in the ears, nose, paws, and tail. And so these enzymes are only active at low temperatures, which explains the black color. <coughs> this limits the extremities, extremities where body heat is lost. So here's a picture, and that is the last slide for this chapter. Thank you very much.